Good evening, everyone. I'm Kim Bottomley. I'm the president of Wellesley College. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you here this evening for a conversation with Secretary of State Madeleine Corbell Albright on pins and diplomacy. Now, at the end of our conversation that we'll have here for a half an hour or so, there will be ample time for questions and answers from the audience. So as you're listening to us talk for a little while, I think of some questions you'd like to ask. This evening's conversation is part of the Read My Pins exhibition on display now at the Davis Museum. Um, I'd like to take a moment to recognize and thank the staff of the Davis Museum, including Lisa Fishman, who is the Ruth Gordon Shapiro Class of 37 Director of the Davis. Thank you very much for all you've done. And now I'm delighted to introduce Madeline Corbell Albright, who is no stranger to Wellesley College. Secretary Albright is a member of the Wellesley class of 1959, where she earned a bachelor's degree with honors. She holds a master's and doctorate degrees from Columbia University's Department of Public Law and Government, as well as a certificate from its Russian Institute. From 1993, to 1997, she served as a U.S. permanent representative to the United Nations and as a member of the President's Cabinet. In 1997, she was named the 64th Secretary of State, becoming the first female to serve in that position and becoming, at that time, the highest ranking woman in the history of the U.S. government. Secretary Albright is a professor in the practice of diplomacy at Georgetown University School of Foreign Affairs. She chairs both the National Democratic Institute for International Affairs and the Pew Global Attitudes Project and serves as president of the Truman Scholarship Foundation. She serves on the Department of Defense's Defense Policy Board as well as on the boards of the Council of Foreign Relations, the Aspen Institute, and the Centers for American Progress. She is the author of five New York Times bestsellers, including, of course, Read My Pins, Stories from a Diplomat's Jewel Box, as well as her most recent book, Prague Winter, A Personal Story of Remembrance and War. In 2012, Secretary Albright received the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian honor from President Obama. <laughs> Secretary Albright, thank you for the example you have set for generations of men and women, leaders and civilians around the globe. It is a pleasure to welcome you back to Wellesley, and let me tell you just how thrilled we are to have Read My Pins on display at our Davis Museum. So I'd like to begin now by asking you a few questions. Why was it important to you that this traveling exhibition came here to Wellesley? Great. Well, thank you very much, President Bottomley came, my good friend. I'm delighted to be here and uh, thrilled to be a graduate of Wellesley College. Uh, we just had our 55th reunion and it was wonderful. And I love this college. I love everything that it represents. And um, everything that it does in terms of education in the most interesting ways. And um, I thought that having the pin uh, exhibit here was just a perfect blending of my love for the college and the college's love for uh, education. The whole purpose of the pin collection is not just to prove how acquisitive I am, but, uh, <laughs> but basically to use the pins and the stories that go with them on foreign policy as kind of a teaching tool and to make foreign policy less foreign. And so uh, it, it fits, and so I'm delighted. And I've been over there, I think, I've, the exhibit has now been in 15 different places, and it isn't just my pride in Wellesley that has me saying that this is one of the most beautiful exhibits, the way that it's been uh, put together. So I, I thank you, and I thank everybody involved with it. Thank you. That's great. Yeah. Uh, 
So there is a pin in the collection that is especially meaningful to Wellesley, which is the oak leaf that we gave to those who win the Wellesley College Alumni Achievement Award, uh, which is the highest award given to our alumni. Why did you include that pin within this wonderful exhibit? Well, because it, um, I think it represents so many different uh, aspects. I went back and I tried to put the collection together in terms of various parts of my life. Um, I did, I had worn a few pins before they all became uh, part of my diplomatic story. And, um, and I think that my time at Wellesley, as I've mentioned, was really important to me. And having the recognition from your own college um, is uh, terrific. I think it, uh, I did like the Medal of Freedom, but this is a, uh, 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 but I, I think being recognized by Wellesley uh, is one of the, the great honors of my life. And it fit into the story, and it's a pretty pin, and so all of it kind of makes it a perfect part of the collection. That's great. And just following one more time on that, um, uh, theme of uh, Wellesley, um, I see that you're wearing uh, the Albright pin that we gave you and you have a Wellesley W on. Um, could you tell us, the audience, the significance of yes. the uh, global pin? Well, the thing that um, I think some of you may know, uh, one of the reasons that this love affair with Wellesley goes on is that five years ago, um, President Bottomley uh, and others worked on establishing with me the Albright Institute here. And the purpose of it is to educate young women in global leadership. And it's a terrific program that takes place uh, between the, the semesters. And there are a group of young women, 40, that are selected to be Albright Fellows. There's Joanne Murray, who is uh, the one who runs it. Thanks, Joanne. Uh, and, um, I, this pin was made for me uh, here in locally, and I wear mine, and each Albright Fellow gets a smaller replica of it. So that is terrific. The W I just got at our class dinner, so uh, <laughs> you know, kind of all goes together. But I love the um, this one, and I have to admit that I do wear it other places uh, when I am traveling, and I want to show the globalism of a particular issue. That's yeah. great. Do you have a favorite or most treasured pin that has some particular significance to you? I do. I actually um, have two that I really like very much. They're both in, in the uh, exhibit. One is a ceramic heart uh, with different colors on it. And my daughter, Katie, made it. And usually people say, well, how old is Katie? And she's 46 at this point, and she says, <laughs> Mom, you have to tell people I made it when I was five. Um, and I'm sure that many parents here have a similar pin that their children made when they were in kindergarten or first grade. And it's very sentimental. I used to wear it every Valentine's Day, but since the show, I have, haven't had it. But her daughter, my granddaughter, made me another set of two little paper hearts that go together. So I have that. The other pin is a very, uh, has a, has a, uh, very meaningful story, and that is I went down to um, New Orleans about a year after Katrina, and I had been invited to go to the World War II Museum there, which is interesting in itself and worth going to. And then there was a dinner uh, for uh, the uh, local people there, and all of a sudden this young man comes up to me and he said, my father is sitting over there, he is a veteran, um, of World War II, and he earned two Purple Hearts. And um, he, this young man has a box in his hand, and he says, this is a pin that my father gave to my mother on their 50th wedding anniversary. And he opens it, and it's this gorgeous pin with two amethysts in it, representative, I'm sure, of the Purple Hearts. And then this young man said, and our mother died as a result of Katrina, and we would like you to have this pin. And I said, I can't possibly accept it. And they said, no, our mother really loved you, and it would be important to us if you have the pin. So I, I said, I'm honored, and I have the pin. And those two, in many ways, um, show how inanimate objects can actually carry a great deal of emotion with them. And so those two are kind of very important to me. That's great. 
How did your pin diplomacy begin? Um, why, did you th why did you think this would be effective for you? Well, in, in many ways, I, mean, I clearly like jewelry. So I, uh, <laughs> um, I went to the United Nations in February 1993. And it was shortly after the Gulf War. And the ceasefire of the Gulf War had been translated into a series of sanctions resolutions um, that had to do with how um, the Saddam Hussein had to make sure to destroy the weapons and to stop terrorizing the population. And the uh, sanctions came uh, up for new mandates constantly, the six of them kind of in order. And I was an instructed ambassador. And my instructions were to make absolutely sure that the sanctions stayed on, which meant that I had to speak up all the time to explain to the members of the Security Council why Saddam Hussein needed to be sanctioned. And I kept saying perfectly terrible things about Saddam Hussein, which he deserved. He'd invaded Kuwait. So all of a sudden, there was a poem that appeared in the papers in Baghdad, comparing me to many things, but among them, an unparalleled serpent. And I had a snake pin. So I decided that when we talked about Iraq, I would wear the snake pin. So I think many of you have noticed that when the ambassadors leave the Security Council meeting, they go out and they meet the press right outside the, the chambers there. So all of a sudden, the cameras zero in on me, and they say, why are you wearing that snake pin? And I said, because Saddam Hussein compared me to an unparalleled serpent. And then I thought, well, this is fun. So I went out, uh, <laughs> and I was the only woman on the Security Council. And so I went out, and I bought a lot of costume jewelry. Uh, easy to do around New York, and I um, decided that I would wear pins that I thought would depict what was going to happen, or what I thought was going to happen on any given day. So on good days, I wore flowers and butterflies and balloons, and on bad days, a lot of horrible insects and uh, <laughs> carnivorous animals. And so finally, the other ambassadors kind of noticed this, and they, and we were always trying to figure out what the agenda for the day was going to be. And I said, well, read my pins. And that is how it all started. <laughs> so you use your pins as part of your sort of diplomatic toolbox, if you will. Do men have an equivalent nonverbal tool in their toolbox? No, they just talk. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I, I do think that. Um, I was trying to figure out if the different colored ties they wear uh, sometimes may have something to do with it. But mostly, this is what I, I learned at the United Nations. First of all, uh, men, foreigners maybe talk longer than Americans, and men talk a lot longer than women. Uh, so I think that they just talked and talked. I had my silent messages. <laughs> so. Um, do you remember your first pin? Was it a gift? Uh, did you buy it? Did it have any significance to you? Um, well, I think uh, I had um, a pin that my mother had, had made out of some of her various other pins, and, and I was given that. Uh, and then I uh, got a pin uh, as a wedding present, a, a fish. And then I, well, actually, before that, while I was here, I wore a circle pin like everybody else uh, um, in, in the 50s. And then I got a fraternity pin. So those were the kinds of things that I wore before the whole diplomatic part of it happened. That's great. So if you were going to meet Vladimir Putin uh, today <laughs> about the Ukrainian crisis, what pin might you want to wear? Yeah, I have now thought about it, but I was asked this question last week, and I came up very quickly with an answer, which I actually think is quite perfect, which is <laughs> a crocodile, uh, an animal that eats others. And um, I think that would be the one. I have a small crocodile. I think I'm about to get a larger one. <laughs> uh, uh. So just broadening that same theme a little bit, if you were appointed Secretary of State today, what pins might you need in your diplomatic toolbox? Well, it's interesting you should ask it that way, because I teach a course at Georgetown. Um, and I say foreign policy is just trying to get some country to do what you want. That's all it is. So 
what are the tools. So the course I teach is called the National Security Toolbox. And um, the truth is there are not a lot of tools in there. And, and let me just say how I even came to that. When um, I was in the Carter administration at the time that the Soviets invaded Afghanistan, and we had a um, kind of interagency meeting where we were trying to decide. We knew that we couldn't get the Soviets out of Afghanistan immediately, but we wanted to punish them. So we had all these different, we sat around trying to think of what to do. So what happened was there was a limit on their fishing rights and there was a grain embargo. Those were economic tools. Then we decided not to send our athletes to the Olympics that year. Um, and, and what it made me, and then there was a call up for the draft and various, and it, it made me realize how few tools there really are in the toolbox. Um, and so when I went back to teaching and had some examples from what it was that uh, various times that we needed to use tools in the Clinton administration, I thought a little bit about what tools. So the, the main tools, and I would try everything at the moment, frankly, uh, the first tool is diplomatic tools, the bilateral and then multilateral, and then the economic tools, which are either sticks or carrots, the carrots being trade and aid and the sticks being sanctions and embargoes. Uh, and then there's the threat of the use of force um, and the use of force, uh, law enforcement and intelligence. So when President Obama says all options are on the table, but that is exactly all the things that he's thinking of. And I think that you do try to use all the tools you possibly can. I, I don't have the guts to teach about my pins, however, as part of the <laughs> toolbox. <laughs> they might not work for everyone. <laughs> Did any of your pins ever get you into trouble? Definitely. Um, I'll tell you what happened is, um, at the 50th anniversary of NATO, uh, we were all having a meeting and somehow uh, President Clinton, Secretary of Defense Bill Cohen and I were on a sofa and all of a sudden, I don't know who did it first, but we did the hear no evil, see no evil monkeys and we looked like crazy people. The picture ended up in Time magazine and everybody <laughs> kind of talked about the, the monkeys. So I thought when we, I was going to Moscow with President Clinton for a summit, with President Putin, uh, and I found three monkeys. They were just great monkey pins, so I decided to wear them. And we walked in, and President Putin turns to President Clinton, and he actually said, we always notice what pins Secretary Albright wears. Why are you wearing those monkeys? And I actually said, because I think your policy in Chechnya is evil. And uh, Putin got furious and, and he said, you shouldn't be talking to the Chechens, you know. And President Clinton looks at me like, are you out of your mind? Um, you are America's chief diplomat. You've now screwed up the whole summit. <laughs> so that's when pins got me into trouble, but they did get me out of trouble also. Uh, I invented the art of diplomatic kissing. You kind of can't visualize Henry Kissinger or Jim Baker going into a country and having big embrace. So it, it's much more complicated than meets the eye because the Latin, some kiss on the right cheek and some on the left cheek and so there are a lot of bump noses and the French kiss twice and the Dutch kiss three times and then Yasser Arafat, just the thought, right? Um, it was uh, very complicated. He was kind of an indomitable kisser. You never knew what was going to happen. So um, I arrived in Korea I uh, had a really great meeting with the Korean foreign minister and I leave and all of a sudden I get a call from a journalist saying, don't you think that the foreign minister of Korea should be fired for what he said about you? And I said, well, what did he say? He said, well, you know, I really like it when Secretary Albright comes because we're about the same age and I'm this tired old man, but when I embrace her, she has very firm breasts. So what do you have to say about that? So I thought quickly and I said, I have to have something to put those pins on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. 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 But, but the next time we met, we had a very <laughs> formal handshake. So if I might ask you just one non-pin question. Um, uh, in, in 2008, you wrote a book entitled A Memo to the President-Elect, How Can We Restore America's Reputation and Leadership? 
have things changed enough so that there might need to be a 2016 memo to the president with new and different advice? Well, um, if that president, if she asks me, I would be very... <laughs> I, uh, I have to say that when I wrote that book, I didn't know who was going to be president. I ultimately inscribed it to President Obama, and I wrote in it with the audacity to hope that this book might be useful. So <laughs> That's great. Um, so I noticed uh, on the banners as you come into campus advertising uh, the, your uh, exhibit, uh, there was a crab, and also on the front page of the Wellesley website, sort of again advertising your, uh, your appearance here today, there's a pin that looks like a crab. And so I was sort of debating whether or not when you wore that pin, pin people sort of assumed the kind of obvious that you were in a bad humor that day or something like that. What is the meaning of that no, pin? No, I usually wore it during Middle East peace talks because all we did was go sideways. <laughs> yeah. <so. laughs> And I think they got it. I had to develop a whole set of pins for the Middle East. Um, what happened was it started when um, I had become secretary and um, Yitzhak Rabin had already been assassinated and his wife Leah was a friend of mine and she sent me a dove pin. And I always wore it when uh, I was giving uh, speeches on the Middle East. And one time I arrived in Jerusalem and there was a necklace of doves with a note that said something like, takes more than one dove to make peace in the Middle East. Um, and then I had turtles, turtles also. Uh, and then when we were having the talks with the Syrians, the Israelis and the Syrians, nothing was happening. And one of the things that happens is there's constant, when you travel, you actually take your own problem with you when you have the press. The press is in the plane with you, they get off, and you've actually been having fairly friendly discussions on the airplane. Then they get, they get off first, they set themselves up on bleachers, you get off the plane, they start screaming at you. Um, and so um, they would always say, so what is going on in these talks all the time? And I said to them, these peace talks like mushrooms need to be in the dark. And so then nothing kept happening, and every time the press would say, you know, so what's happening? And I would just say, mushrooms, mushrooms. And I think they probably thought I was talking about something else. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, ultimately, I got mushroom pins for that. So I had a whole kind of series of uh, pins for the Middle East. But the cra that's the crab. Not that I was feeling crabby, but that uh, <laughs> they were. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm going to ask you one more question, and I just want to say that those of you who are thinking about asking a question, we will put up some microphones for you to be able to uh, ask the questions in a few minutes. So um, what proportion of your pins are on display at this exhibit compared to the, your entire pin collection? I never was very good at math. <laughs> <laughs> and how do you store them? I mean, you have this sort of thought about this huge collection of pins and, um, you know, if you're anything like me, my pins are sort of like, you know, piled on top of each other on a, on a dresser drawer. How do you store your pins? Well, and those, I, you know? um, what happened as they were accumulating, I actually found, you know, they looked like little shoe bags, but I mean, uh, hangers that have these long pockets that you put in. So I had originally stored them all by color. And then when we were getting ready to write this book, I took them all out and put them on the bed on a white sheet and really looked like a fabulous modern painting. And then we decided to store them by species. So, um, but so that, that is what has happened. Uh, I, I have acquired kind of an, a whole new collection uh, because the ones that have all the foreign policy stories are, are in the show. Um, and. Um, so I don't know how many I have, and I call the new pins my pity pins because either I'm feeling sorry for myself or somebody feels sorry for me by, by giving me pins. But uh, it does seem kind of nutty, but I have a lot. I really do, and, uh, and I love them. They're a lot of fun. That's great. So now we'll open it up for questions from the audience. Uh, anything I think would be fair game to ask uh, Secretary Albright while she is here. Um, I 
I would just ask you just to speak a little slowly and not too close to the mic because we get a lot of uh, reverberation back here. Sure. Um, my name is Sam Chin, and I'm a Wellesley College class of 2017er. Um, and I was wondering, when have you felt most intimidated or unsuccessful, and how have you coped with that? Uh, many times over my life. Uh, I think that one of the things, and I, I often say this especially to groups that are, have a lot of women in them, is I've often felt very intimidated in meetings where I was the only woman, um, wherever it was, and I always would think to myself, I wanted to say something, and then I'd think, well, that's going to sound stupid, so I don't say it, and then some man says it, and everybody thinks it's brilliant, and I'm really <laughs> very mad at myself. So um, I, when I started teaching, I thought about that fact and that what I wanted to teach and what I had to learn myself was how to interrupt um, because women always raise their hands and often in meetings by the time you're called on, it's not germane and so um, I think that that's one of the issues. I made up a term which probably wouldn't pass education muster, but it's kind of to have active listening, because if you're going to interrupt, um, you have to listen in a different way, but you also have to know what you're talking about. Um, and so in a firm voice to, to learn to interrupt. Problem is that it's even hard for me to learn that lesson. And one of the things that happened in real life on this was when I got to the Security Council, as I mentioned in 1993, I was the only woman. And most of the meetings don't take place in that fancy room that's on TV, but in a smaller kind of room, and everybody sits in alphabetical order, and I get there, and there are 15 members on the Security Council, so 14 men kind of sat there looking at me. And I thought, well, I won't speak today. I'll just see if anybody likes me and what the room is really like. And then I looked at the sign in front of my name, and it said United States. And I knew if I didn't speak that day that the voice of the United States would not be heard. And so it, when I'm in, I really, it's an active thing of when you feel intimidated to interrupt. Thank you. Yeah. Hello there. Um, I think my question actually follows up or is similar to that. You have worked in the highest levels of international whatever, international <laughs> politics, what do we call it? And um, you have worked in these extremely male situations. And so what, you know, what have you had to summon for yourself? Um, ha you know, have you felt that pretty consistently? Have you related to women diplomats in a different type of way? You know, what really gave you strength to, to do that? Well, first of all, let me say I went to a girls' high school. One of my classmates is here, Mary Paul. Uh, I went to a women's college, uh, which I think did teach me to speak up, uh, and, and I think it made a difference. Uh, we were just recalling, I used to start international relations clubs everywhere, make myself president. Um, so uh, I have always kind of, uh, you know, been involved and, and thought about that. I think that um, it is important to have other women in terms of a support system. So. What happened was when I got to the United Nations, at the time there were 183 countries in the UN, and it was one of the first times that I didn't have to cook lunch myself. And so I asked my assistant to invite the other women permanent representatives to, to lunch. So I get to my residence, and out of 183 countries, there are six other women. Uh, and the representatives of Kazakhstan, Canada, Philippines, Trinidad, Tobago, Jamaica, Liechtenstein, and me. Uh, being the American, I created a caucus, um, and we called ourselves the G7, uh, and uh, we decided that we would do the girl thing, that we would always take each other's telephone calls, um, which made some of the main uh, permanent representatives angry and they'd say, why would you talk to Liechtenstein? Uh, and I said, well, you know, you can just have yourself uh, replaced by a woman and I'd be very happy to take your phone call. <laughs> um, the, uh, um, and then, 
what we did was decide to, well, we'd get together and we'd talk about various experiences that we'd had. And what was interesting was the similarity of a lot of the women diplomats' experiences within their own systems. And then we would um, you know, make, take some serious stands. And one of them uh, was to try to get women judges on the war crimes tribunals that, had, that were on the Balkans, because most of the crimes had been committed against women. We managed to get two women judges on that. Uh, and what is interesting is we were working at that stage to make rape declared a weapon of war. Um, if you've been following the news, there's just been a big conference on that now. Uh, Secretary Kerry went over there, Angelina Jolie has been working on it, how to get rape declared a weapon of war. And I think having a group of women and men who believe in this to, to move forward. When I was secretary, I created a group of women foreign ministers. Uh, and we met regularly. At that stage, there were only 14 of us in, in the world. But I think the numbers are expanding. And so I do think that having a support group makes a difference. The thing that I think is also out there, though, is women have to support each other. Uh, it doesn't happen all the time, frankly. Uh, I think that some of the times that I was intimidated was by guilt, uh, which is we do that a lot to each other. Uh, why aren't you home with your children, or why aren't you working in a full-time job, or whatever. And so the single most famous statement I ever made is that there's a special place in hell for women who don't help each other. No, 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 no. Um, I'm interested in any of your pins. Um, you have a relationship with the artist. Uh, when I saw your collection, I was really struck by the beauty of so many of them, no matter whether they were really high quality jewels or as you were talking about costume jewelry. But I was just wondering, wondering if any of the pins, the artist had a special meaning for you. Um, well, uh, sometimes, frankly, because I didn't always know who the creators were. And then when I met them, you could see that they were very artistic and we had uh, great Conversations, Leia Stein, who are some of the neat pins and, and various ones. And so um, I think a lot of them, they're just, one of the things that I like about my whole collection is that they aren't expensive and anybody can really enjoy the colors or the uh, construct or the message and that it's a wonderful way to participate in art in a way that is just uh, special and honors the person who made it and if you're wearing it. So it's, it's a personal way to do it. Um, you were talking uh, earlier about the diplomatic uh, toolbox and I'm wondering now what advice you would give to Kerry in the present situation in the Mideast where everything seems to be falling apart, there are no states really to be dealt with, but this ISIS situation, um, what, would you advi what advice would you give him? Well, let me, if I could put that into a little bit of context. Um, President Clinton was an avid reader, and he also assigned books to us. And one of, that he said that I had to read was a book called The Peace to End All Peace by an American historian, David Fromkin which was about the creation of the modern Middle East after the First World War. And the reason I say that is what's happening here has a lot to do with that. Um, the short version of the book is that the modern Middle East was created by British and French diplomats lying to each other. Um, and a lot of the countries were created in that particular way. Uh, the Ottoman Empire was broken up and a lot of boundaries were drawn um, in a way by people sitting in rooms uh, based on some of the um, Ottoman history and the colonial history. And what we're seeing is the disintegration of some of those states because they were not created, they, they put different groups of people together. One of the books that I wrote um, was about the role of God and religion in foreign policy. Um, and I'm going to take a little longer on this because I think this is a really serious thing that people need to understand. I'm the first Secretary of State that put Muslim holidays on the official calendar. 
uh, and we celebrated iftar dinners and tried to figure out how to understand Islam better. And um, what happened was that uh, uh, um, when I left the department and I kind of, I'd, I myself had learned an awful lot about it, I wrote that, the book specifically in order to try to understand better about the role of religion, both Christian, uh, Jewish, and Muslim, and then other uh, religions, but basically um, those three. And um, most Americans didn't know the difference between a Sunni and a Shia. Um, and understanding the background of all of that, their different arguments. Uh, and I think that what we are seeing now in the Middle East is a combination of different sects divided up that were in divided, the Kurds for instance are interesting in that they are not, not only in Iraq but there's some in Turkey and in Azerbaijan and in the region. Then there is the whole Sunni Shia issue uh, represented most vividly by Iran and Saudi Arabia and then there are the growths of various um, terrorist groups uh, and rebels who um, uh, have kind of morphed into terrorist groups. So this is a massive mess, that, that's a diplomatic term. Uh, and one of the things, I think it's going to, what we're basically seeing is a Sunni Shia fight uh, and over national territories that were created in this particular way, uh, both after World War I and World War II. So, I think that what we're seeing is the problems in Syria that I had been saying for some time were kind of like an ink blot spreading through the area. Uh, and I think it's going to take quite a long time to deal with it. I had been in Jordan two summers ago, last summer, uh, and uh, just the number of refugees that are in a small country like Jordan, they have Palestinian refugees, Iraqi refugees, and Syrian refugees. The number is equivalent to as if the United States had 40 million refugees. We can't even deal with 11 million undocumented workers. So just imagine the, the small country or Lebanon that has been taken over by huge numbers of refugees. So there's that humanitarian issue. And then you have the problem of Iraq where um, the uh, previous administration um, actually destroyed the Iraqi military and the state and it's just completely disembodied in many different ways and you have Prime Minister Maliki who has not been inclusive in terms of uh, including not only the Kurds but also the Sunnis and so uh, I think that what has to happen and President Obama has made that statement is that the political part of this has to be dealt with uh, there have to be the possible, my toolbox, the threat of the use of force has to be there. Uh, we have moved air, an aircraft carrier and some other ships uh, close by in order to be able to help evacuate people. Our embassy is one of the biggest, well it is the biggest embassy in the world, it's fortified completely. But I think there's a lot of concern, there has to be diplomacy. And I think the questions that are out there is with whom do we deal? Uh, we have a variety of issues with the Iranians, um, obviously the nuclear issue. We have um, similar um, interests for the moment, but do we have similar goals? Um, we are talking with the Iranians over the nuclear issues. How much do we talk to them about these other aspects? It is an unbelievably complicated situation. Uh, and who do we deal with uh, in Syria? Um, and then there's always the Israeli-Palestinian issue. So it's a very, very unsettled um, region of the world that is going to um, take an awful lot of time. But that whole toolbox has to be out there. I'm sorry to take so long, but I do think it is one of the things that... Uh, yeah. I'm Kim Ozenbeck. I am also a member of the class of 2017. I have a, another diplomacy-related question for you. Um, what role do you feel diplomacy holds today in economic development, international ec economic development? Um, well, I am um, a great deal. Let me just say this, is that um, as we look at the world, there are, um, you know, it's always kind of divided between developed and developing countries, which is kind of broad 
generalizations in some developed countries are having a lot of problems and some developing countries are doing pretty well, some based on the kinds of resources they have and also what kind of governments they have. We also have the issue of a very large uh, divide between rich and poor. I think one of the issues in my memo to the president-elect, I wrote about that there were five big umbrella issues that had to be dealt with. Uh, one was uh, how to fight terrorism without creating more terrorists, how to deal with the issue of nuclear proliferation, and how to deal with the growing gap between the rich and the poor in the world. In absolute numbers, there are fewer poor people, primarily due to the number of people that the Chinese have brought out of poverty. But the gap between the rich and the poor is larger. And while there is no direct line between poverty and terrorism, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to realize that people that are completely alienated from their societies are more recruitable. Um, I do think that there are any number of reasons to have good economic development. One of the things I'm sure you study in class, because I did, is kind of what comes first, political or economic development. The truth is they go together, because uh, democracy or government has to deliver. People want to vote and eat. And so the question is how economic development is dealt with. How do you um, diplomatically suggest uh, ideas about what is the best uh, way to develop economically. Do you have trade or is trade viewed as a way of robbing a country rather than really working with it? And so I think it's a huge issue and very important to look at what the basis of economic development is and then diplomatically uh, try to figure out, you know, integration into regional markets, uh, free trade agreements. I mean, for instance, right now, one of the issues is um, the Trans-Pacific, the uh, trade talks that are going on. Some of them with, I mean, the Chinese call themselves the world's largest developing country. So um, there are various aspects to it, but it's very, very um, germane to talk about economic development and diplomacy. Hi, I'm Donna Dervar at Class of 77, and I recall hearing you speak at a recent reunion, not this year, but several years back, and you, you spoke about how free you felt now that you could speak your mind, not being constrained by um, the limits of your former position. So are there particular occasions that you've had since you left the position of Secretary of State where you've really enjoyed that freedom? Uh, all the time. I mean, I, I, uh, one of the things, just to tell you what it's like when you are in office, uh, Basically, it had never occurred to me that something I said would end up on the front pages of a newspaper. Or So I had, when I started out as UN ambassador, um, I was actually in Geneva. We'd had talks, this goes back to the Iraq sanctions thing, and the question about how much oil the Iraqis were going to sell. And um, uh, I said something about the fact that they were going to have to pay for um, the food and oil, the food and medicine that were going in. And I'm packing and all of a sudden they said, oil prices went up today thanks to the statements of an American diplomat. And I thought, what did I do? Uh, and so I quickly called home and I, I said, did I say something wrong? And they said, no. But all of a sudden it made very clear to me that I had to parse every single word. Then also, as you uh, prepare for testimony, for instance, in hearings of how do you end, the hearings are actually yellings. Uh, that, uh, that is something I can say now that I couldn't say then, where uh, I think you've seen and where various members of Congress believe they have to actually express uh, what they say before they ever get to the question. And if you ever get a chance to answer it, it's a miracle. But the bottom line is you have to think about how, how to answer it. You kind of have to go through um, kind of a sieve or a grid in your own head as to what is the right thing to say. I now regularly say, because I love to give speeches and before I answer questions, I say I'm so pleased to be able to answer your questions and since I'm no longer in the government, I will actually be able to answer them. So, uh, but there is a sense of freedom uh, in terms of being able to use whatever you learned at Wellesley to uh, answer the questions. Yes. Hi, I'm Alex, class of 2001. Um, and when I was looking at your pins, I um, 
the glass ceiling, the glass pin stuck out, uh, stuck out to me. Um, and as being a Wellesley alum, we've, we've watched you and Hillary um, just shatter those ceilings with sledgehammers. And I'm wondering um, what that pin means to you. What, when, you when have you worn it? Um, when you wear it, what does it mean to you? And um, what ceilings do we have left to bring a sledgehammer to? I think the part that um, is very interesting is uh, how hard it was for a woman to become Secretary of State. Um, I have to say now, my youngest granddaughter, when she turned seven four years ago, said, so what's the big deal about Grandma Maddie being Secretary of State? <laughs> uh, only girls are Secretary of State, and in her lifetime, that was true. And I'm sure there's some little boys out there now who are taking great inspiration from John Kerry. Uh, <laughs> but uh, there really uh, were questions about, about it. And it was not shattering to become ambassador to the UN, because Jean Kirkpatrick had preceded me on that. And, um, but there really were questions about whether a woman could be Secretary of State, and people would say, well, the Arab leaders will not deal with a woman. So because I'd been at the UN, the Arab ambassadors got together and they put out a statement saying, we've had no problems dealing with Ambassador Albright. We would have no problems dealing with, with a Secretary Albright. I actually had, um, there, was, there was, what happens in Washington, your name is out there for a while, and it kind of, it, there's a lot of speculation, and one of the things that happened, and I never want to know who did this, uh, there was somebody at the White House who said, yes, Madeline's on the list, but she's second tier. And uh, so then what? You know, and now, I would not have become Secretary of State if it hadn't been for Hillary. And the reason I know that is because President Clinton said so publicly um, when we were traveling somewhere. And we used to do this thing where I would introduce her, and she would introduce him, and he gets up and he said, during this period that this issue was going on, that Hillary said, why um, wouldn't you name Madeline? She is the one that is closest to your views. She expresses them better than anybody else. And besides, it would make your mother happy. So that is uh, how it happened. But I was given the, the, the pin. And um, there's a great picture of when Hillary and I are actually in, the, in a ladies' room where nobody was. Uh, and um, and I think that kind of working together on that uh, in terms of the capability, and it goes back to an earlier question about support from other women. But it does mean that it can be done, but it isn't over. And let me just say, because I believe in symbols and things, is that uh, I was giving, uh, I'm, as was mentioned, I, was chairman of the, I am chairman of the board of this organization called the National Democratic Institute. And they, there's a lunch that was just given uh, in order to raise money to train women politicians all over the world. And I wore, I had the pin on because I have another copy of it. And I was getting out of the car and it fell off and it shattered even more. And I thought, okay, I went to give the speech and I had all the pieces of glass in my hand. And I said, we shattered some of it, but the shattering keeps going on in terms of not having everything that we need, and we need to keep looking at how to shatter other ceilings together. Okay. Okay. Right. Yeah. To follow up on a piece to end all peace, I read your interview with Oprah Winfrey, and when you said, when the president recommends you read a book, you read it. So I read the book after you recommended it. Therefore, to follow up with that, what book would you recommend we read now? Uh, hard Choices. <laughs> Um, my question concerns some uh, banners that were hanging on the Wellesley College campus a few years back, and they had women who will make a difference in the world, and your name was on them, and Hillary Clinton's name was on them, and other illustrious um, leaders in the conventional sense, and not in a um, bad way conventional, of course. Um, and then a little after that, in the chapel were hung these banners that said, women who will take naps, and women who will laugh, and women who will play. And I think there was an attempt to um, make it seem like 
There were many ways to make a difference in the world. And I would love to hear you as someone who has led both of those lives and perhaps sim simultaneously at times, um, what your thoughts are about those two ways of looking at the idea of success or whatever. Well, I think that, um, first of all, I do think that uh, life is long and women's lives come in segments, some due to biology and other reasons, and that basically we need to take advantage of that. And I think women can do everything, but they don't, it doesn't happen, happen all at the same time. Um, and um, I kind of, my life was different, I think, from uh, your age group, and, and being here really reminds me of it, and the reunion that we just had. I, um, I graduated on June 8th and waited a really long time to get married. I got married on June 11th. Uh, and um, so, uh, you know, I was 22 years old. I had thought that I would be a journalist. That's what I wanted to do. I was one of the editors of Wellesley News. And, um, and then when my husband went into the Army right away, uh, we were down in Missouri, and I got a job on a small newspaper in Rolla, Missouri. And then we moved back to Chicago, where he, had, he was a year ahead of me, and where he already was a journalist. And we were having dinner with his managing editor, and his managing editor said to me, so what are you going to do, honey? And uh, I said, I'm going to be a journalist. And he said, I don't think so. And he said, you can't work on the same paper as your husband uh, and, uh, because of guild regulations. And even though there were three other papers in Chicago at, the, at that time, he said, you wouldn't want to compete with your husband, so go find something else to do. So instead of what you might say or what I might say now, I saluted and started another life. Uh, I spent a long time kind of trying to get my act together. I had twins two years later and trying to, to what you're asking is about life balance of how to try to put things together. And it goes back to a little bit of an answer I gave earlier. One of the hard parts was other women you know, because I was getting my PhD while I had these children and uh, so people would say, well, why aren't you at home with your children? Wouldn't you prefer to be in the carpool line than studying about the Soviet Union? Uh, and so I think we do things to our, each other that complicate lives. I do think that um, we, we shouldn't be so judgmental about each other. Uh, and, and I think that, try, and there is no one pattern. I, when I, when I went to Georgetown initially to teach, I was hired as a role model, which is a really weird thing, um, and trying to, to deal with young women. And there is no pattern. And I think that's the hardest part to tell you, is everybody has to work out their own. But the main thing is that we can't judge each other about it. And women have a tendency to project our own weaknesses onto another woman. So for instance, I worked for Geraldine Ferraro at the time that she was the vice presidential candidate. And we were traveling around, we were somewhere in Nebraska or someplace, and a woman came up to me and said, how can, can she talk to Russians? I can't talk to a Russian. Well, nobody was asking this woman to talk to a Russian, you know, and, and so there's this kind of sense, I can't do it, so how can she? And so I think that, for me, is the lesson in terms of giving each other space and also understanding that there isn't one uh, pattern. I was very lucky. I know that's something you're not supposed to say, but I was lucky because I had my credentials together when they were looking for the one woman. Uh, and I do think getting your credentials together so that when you want to do something, you're ready, and when you don't, you don't have to. So wonderful to hear you speak. Um, and I'm going to totally change the subject because our book club just finished reading Prague Winter, which we thoroughly enjoyed. And I was just fascinated to, I never knew the history of Czechoslovakia during World War II, so that was, you know, even though I've studied it, you know, World War II, that was a whole new aspect to learn. But I was also fascinated with your relationship with your parents, particularly your dad. And I wanted you to kind of comment about your dad's influence over your career or, or, you know, I mean, because what, what you did and, and coming, you know, the career you've had, I think had to have its roots at a very young age. And, 
you know, when I read that story when you couldn't come home at Christmas time from your boarding school and it was just because your parents were trying to protect you from what was going on in Prague, you lived in a very political family and, uh, and I would imagine, so I'd love you to just comment on your life Thank as a you. young well, girl. My father was a Czechoslovak diplomat and we spent the war in England uh, and he was with the government in exile. Uh, and then uh, after the war, we went back and he was ambassador in Yugoslavia. And so, uh, you know, the little girl in the national costume that gives flowers at the airport, that's what I did for a living. Uh, and I grew up basically in a diplomatic family. Um, and I'm the oldest, and all I ever wanted to do was to be the perfect daughter. Um, my father is long dead, I am old, I still want to be the perfect daughter. So. He really had the most amazing influence on my life. And um, what was so interesting about him and my mother was their capability of adjusting their lives to very different circumstances. They had both come from fairly well-to-do families in Czechoslovakia. Then all of a sudden we are refugees in England during the war. Then they, he becomes an ambassador and we have chefs and chauffeurs. Uh, and then we come to the United States and we're displaced persons. And we went to Denver uh, where my father uh, uh, taught and ultimately became dean of the Graduate School of International Studies. And uh, he, and all I, we ever did was talk about foreign policy. I mean, that was really, uh, other people might talk about other things at dinner, but that's all we ever talked about. Uh, and um, he had a huge influence on me in every single way. I mean, what, when I wrote my honors thesis here um, on a Czechoslovak political figure. My father had just written a book about the communist subversion of Czechoslovakia. I just found um, my uh, thesis, my honors thesis, I am going to turn it over to Wellesley, uh, where I had sent it to my father and he corrected parts of it, <laughs> you know, uh, and um, so just, just a very, very large influence in every single way. I'm going to tell a story which shows that he had influence on, on somebody else also, which is that you know how I am related to Hil Hillary through Wellesley. So what happened was that my father ultimately became dean of this graduate school, and in 1977 he died, and he was a really big deal in Denver by that time. And there were lots of flowers and tributes and things. And among them was this ceramic pot in the shape of a piano with just a bunch of leaves in it. And I said to my mother, where did this come from? And she said, it's from your father's favorite student, Condoleezza Rice. She had gone to the University of Denver. Her parents were associated with it. She was a music major, hence the piano. So uh, she, uh, my, she took an international relations course from my father. Uh, and he persuaded her to become an international relations major. She did her master's at Notre Dame and was working on her PhD with my father when he died. So this African-American woman from Alabama, music major, wrote her dissertation on the Czechoslovak military. <laughs> so in 1987, when I was working for my long list of losing Democratic presidential candidates, <laughs> uh, I was working for Michael Dukakis, and <clears throat> so my job was to find foreign policy advisors. So I thought, you know, well, I'd call her up and I said, uh, you know, here she was, a woman, Soviet expert teaching on the West Coast, and I told her what I was doing, and, you know, I'm looking for foreign policy advisors, Condi, and she said, Madeline, I don't know how to tell you this, but I'm a Republican. Uh, and I said, Condi, how could you be? We had the same father. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. 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 Hi, two questions. The first is, which government you think you're the most impressive with and the United States can learn the most from? And the second is, it's a little bit crazy, but my favorite lyric has always been John Lennon's, imagine there is no country. If our world has really no country, would you think it would be better off? If our world had no country. Yeah, I, you have asked a very complicated question in, in a new way, which is, um, I believe that, and, and one of the, I've been giving some, a speech kind of about this, which is there are some mega trends going on at the moment, and one is globalization, which is 
and interchange of people and travel and uh, uh, getting customs unions down and a variety of aspects. I think what has happened as a result of globalization is that it feels very uh, impersonal and people feel lost. So what they are doing is grouping themselves more and more by their ethnic group or their religion. And so mainly because people do kind of feel, who am I in the middle of all of this? And I think there's nothing wrong. In fact, it's, you know, there's a tendency to try to be with people that you can identify with. There's a problem, however, when your own identity is expressed by disliking the, the, the other people. And what we're seeing now is, a, in many ways, a virulent rise of nationalism, which is the, uh, the worst part of being patriotic, I think. And so if you think that your country or your people are better, smarter, et cetera, than the people next door, that, that's when they imagine. And so I think that, um, I think it's, it, it's hard not to have countries. I mean, we've talked about borders. What is interesting in the new, in the international system as it is now, there are other actors within the system. They're non-state actors, which are uh, not just terrorists, but they're also multinational corporations or non-governmental organizations or various, which are also operating within the system. I have, this is germane as I'll get to this. The last time I heard Imagine Sung was at Walter Reed Hospital, where I had gone to visit a group of veterans uh, who were all disabled. And I had met these people um, at a concert that they were giving, they're called Music Corps. And when I go there, the first person is sitting there and he's a, big, handsome young man, had said he had graduated from USC. He had one leg and was bald and had a gash across his head. And he said, I don't care about my leg. I can get another leg. It's my brain. And what he was doing was playing the piano uh, because he could read notes, but he couldn't read letters. And he was playing on the piano, Let It Be. So then what happens, this other group comes in and they are mostly, have no legs, and they wheel themselves in, and they play Imagine. And I practically lost it in so many ways. And so when you think about what happens as a result of fighting and virulent nationalism, then it's hard. But it's, you've asked a very complicated question, and I think it's your generation that has to help sort it out. Well, thank you so much for your talk. And as you were talking about different countries, the US was dealing with, say, um, China, Russia, and different countries in the Middle East. I was just wondering, it would be really difficult to you know, spend equal time on these countries. And would you say that there is a priority list when it comes to the US government dealing with different regions of the world? Because, I mean, foreign policy is always about domestic affairs. Well, domestic welfare. And do you think the U.S. should have a priority list when it comes to dealing with different regions? Um, this is where it gets so hard, which is why Hard Choices is a good book to read, including mine. Um, but the bottom line is that we do have priorities, but they get superseded sometimes by events. And uh, one of the things that President Obama was doing, based on reality, was to rebalance to Asia. Um, the United States is not a monogamous country. We are a Pacific and an Atlantic power. And uh, the bulk of the people live um, in the, on the Asia Pacific region. And they're really a priority, I happen to believe, that our relationship with China is the most important relationship of this part of the 21st century. And there's no question that there was more and more uh, rebalancing towards Asia for a variety of, of domestic reasons, ours and theirs, uh, and obviously now issues to do with the ex what is happening in terms of the relationships among the Chinese, the Koreans, and the Japanese, all that. 
But when he was rebalancing to Asia, it was interesting. I got a question, was out traveling, and somebody said, so what are you going to do about West Asia? And I thought, what is West Asia? It's the Middle East. So um, what has happened is what's happened in the Middle East has become something that has to be dealt with. And then part of the reason that President Obama thought that he could rebalance to uh, Asia was that we were dealing with a different kind of Russia and a Europe that was in fact uh, organized and could be a very good partner uh, and that changed also in terms of what Russia has been doing vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine and the importance that that takes and how do the, the, our European allies behave. We also have a a lot of people being killed in Africa, in the Central African Republic or Sudan, uh, and um, obviously issues that are going on in Latin America with Venezuela and Cuba. And so one of the hard parts when you come into the government, you try to develop a set of priorities and a vision, and then they sometimes get overtaken by events. And so that is the hard part, and the question is, what is in America's net? If you are president or secretary of state or secretary of defense, you have to figure out what are U.S. national interests. And people define them differently. Um, and, and I think that is the part that makes decision making so terribly hard. But there has been a priority specifically to look at Asia. And then we, we had the discussion about the Middle East. And it makes it, it's, it's a difficult decision. We have to be able to do everything. I happen to believe that the world can't exist without the United States involved. And the question in terms of the, that I answered about Prague winter, for me, my life has really revolved around the fact when the United States is not there, as it wasn't during Munich, terrible things happen. When America came into World War II, and I was a little girl in England, and we just commemorated Normandy, everything changed. When the United States, as a result of decisions made during World War II, allowed the Soviet Union to liberate Central and Eastern Europe, everything changed. And so I am for American engagement, and I do believe we're the indispensable nation, but there's nothing in the word indispensable that means alone. It means that we have to be engaged with partners who have the same values. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you. I'm from the class of 1990. Uh, I have a question, but first I want to offer some personal thanks. I went to graduate school after Wellesley. I was a TA for a history of foreign policy class, and I had to listen to the professor on the first day announce to all the students there would be no women in the material for the class because there were no important women in foreign policy. So thank you for becoming Secretary of State. <laughs> He, he can't say that anymore. Um, uh, my question's a follow-up uh, to the glass ceiling question. Uh, I'm, I'd love to hear some more from you about mentorship. You've talked and written very movingly about uh, mentorship to peers and offering mentorship to you know, those who you see potential who are coming up the ranks. Um, I'm wondering who you would point to as your own mentors and also uh, how to find mentors. Um, especially if none kind of volunteer themselves for you. Thank you. Um, it's a little bit of a mixed story. Obviously, my father, as we talked about it, was one of my major mentors. But my professors at Wellesley were. Um, um, I had amazing professors, Margaret Ball, who was a renowned expert on international relations, and um, Ilona Evans, who was a great professor on international law. Um, and she taught me something which was about role playing. Uh, in our class, we actually, I was the chief justice on the Iceland fisheries case. I will never forget that. And um, one of the things I do when I teach at Georgetown is uh, we do uh, game simulation all the time. And I try to make sure uh, that uh, women are able to have men work for them uh, and have some of the high level jobs. And I think. A lot of that begins at that point um, in terms of respect for each other uh, in that. There were no, I did not have a lot, aside from my Wellesley professors, a lot of female mentors. 
because there weren't a lot. And part of the issue is to find male mentors who also uh, can be your sponsors and your mentors. And um, Ed Muskie, who I worked for, and Walter Mondale, and, um, and my professor at Columbia is Bignef Brzezinski. So I think that one can't decide that you can't have a male mentor. Um, I also am going to say something that may irritate people. Uh, I would not support a woman uh, that has views that I disagree with on choice or on a number of issues. Uh, and not just to be for any woman because she is a woman. I think that um, there are a lot of men that I think can be very helpful uh, in terms of uh, learning and playing and being mentors. But I do think, to go back to something I said earlier, women have to try to figure out how not to make each other feel guilty um, and to be helpful to each other. And I think the hardest part, at least earlier, was if there is the whole queen bee complex, which is basically if there's only one job at the top, it's going to be me and not you. Uh, when in fact, what needs to happen is to realize that you, you want to have that support of other women when you're up there. And when you've climbed the ladder of success is not to push it away. So I think that there are various parts of that that have to be learned. As the last stop, I also want to say thank you. You're, this was an enjoyable and highly enlightening evening. I have a two-part question. One is, do your daughters um, wear a lot of pins, and is there a reverse pin diplomacy in the family? That's one. <laughs> and two is, as an advocate for higher education, and specifically one that supports women, women's leadership, women's role in the world at large, um, I see the a third side to your economics politics, which is education, and that without education, we can't change the world. So how do you promulgate an educational system that supports women in all these disadvantaged uh, areas of the world? I don't think you're going to believe how these two parts, your two-part question actually go together. <laughs> I have three daughters, uh, twins, um, and a younger daughter. and. Uh, actually, on the pin part, they say, what are we going to do with all this stuff? Uh, so we do not have that. But um, one of my, twin, I, my twins, one is a judge, and one has just taken over an organization called Global Partners for Education, which is a World Bank program about educating everybody, but particularly women. Uh, and we had a dinner last night talking about this because the chairman of her board is um, uh, the former Prime Minister of Australia. Uh, and uh, we were having discussions about how education um, globally is a basis of health programs, of uh, security in countries. I can argue it as a national security issue, as a rich versus poor issue. Uh, it is absolutely essential, there is no question. And when we see what has been happening, especially in terms of education of women, um, what a difference it makes when women are educated and what happens when they're not, or the fear of having educated women in terms of what's just happened in, in Nigeria, I think that it is a crucial underpinning of everything that, that we really need to work on. So I'm very proud that my daughter is very involved in that and, we, and that how hard it is, frankly, in order to get support um, internationally. We were talking about uh, how, how much that it doesn't take a lot of money, but trying to persuade people that it is worth doing something now when the payoff on it takes a little bit longer than some of the economic programs. And so I do think it is absolutely essential and clearly what I'm, Wellesley is so also involved in international programs. One of the things that I love about the institute that was created here, the Albright Institute, is a way of trying to look at global leadership and then trying to figure out what the networking is going to be among women in terms of pursuing uh, some of these issues. I give a lot of speeches. It, I, um, I have to say, I was the first woman that actually put women's issues central to American foreign policy. 
not just because I'm a feminist, but because I know that societies are better off when women are politically and economically involved. Hillary took it to a whole new level. And the bottom line is, is that it does make a difference. And if you argue whoever we're talking about domestic and foreign policy going together, it really, you can argue that societies are better off and education is one of the things that does happen when women are politically and economically empowered. It's a good way to end this. I think. So I would like to thank you all for coming and thank you to Secretary Albright for a fabulous conversation.